Jesus is arrested. What happens next? And let's get into some of the human details. I think the average Christian in reading the story is looking at it from Jesus' point of view, looking at it from the point of view of the frightened disciples. What they don't usually think about is how about looking at it from Pilate's point of view mm -hmm. or from the point of view of Caiaphas. Mm. And what a lot of Christians don't know is that Caiaphas as the high priest was rather low in the public opinion polls. Uh, it, it, the priests themselves were admired by most Jewish people, but the aristocratic ruling priests were not. They were seen as oppressive, avaricious, greedy, and so forth. Disconnected. Very much so. In fact, you know, there's an actual text from antiquity. It's not in the Bible, but it's an ancient text where a high priest is quoted saying, do not touch me lest you pollute me in my office. I mean, that's not, that's not going to go over very well. Right with the people. And so the difficulty Caiaphas has is, how do I condemn this man who frightens me, who has criticized me in my own backyard in the temple precincts? And rising in popularity. Oh, the people love him. He's known as a healer and an exorcist. He's talking about the kingdom of God. He's implying that there will be regime change. He's approachable on a human level. Oh, Jesus. People reach out and touch him. He touches people. He right. blesses children. I cannot compete with him. He's trouble. And if I can't control the crowds, the Romans will remove me from office. So what do I do? Mm. I have to get rid of him. Of course, Pontius Pilate, he doesn't live in Jerusalem. He lives at a beach resort called Caesarea Maritima. Mm -hmm. He's a good politician. He shows up in Jerusalem at Passover time. It's a way of saying, hey, listen, I know it's an important holiday for you. I'm here. Mm -hmm. So he shows up and he's got a mess on his hands. And the last thing he wants is to be blamed for the death of a popular Galilean Jewish preacher. So these are the dynamics going on behind the scenes. And part of it is civil or governmental, and another is um, religious. And um, as, I, as I read the scriptures, there are, it seems to me, these multiple trials. Mark's gospel tells us that they met Thursday evening, and uh, Jesus has been seized. He was praying where he had been doing every night that week, Passion Week on the Mount of Olives. Judas, the betrayer, has, has told them, I know where he goes, I can show you, and that's what he's done. So now what do they do with him? So Caiaphas invites, I think he knows, people who will support him to his home. They interrogate Jesus. They get frustrated because they really can't implicate him with a testimony that agrees. And so finally, Caiaphas just asks him up front, tell us plainly, are you really the Messiah, the Son of God? Which is what he's asked him. And Jesus says, yes, I am. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand coming with the clouds of heaven. That is a bold statement. He has combined Psalm 110, which is a royal psalm, with that uh, vision in Daniel 7. He is saying, the next time we meet, I will judge you. Mm. And Caiaphas mm. is outraged. Mm. And Mark says they all agreed that he should be put to death. All. But the very next morning, Friday morning, they have to make this official. <clears throat> it's only a committee recommendation, as it were, to use modern language. A committee met informally in the high priest's house. They recommend and they bring the recommendation forward to the, the parliament, as it were, the Sanhedrin, the council. They gather Friday morning and it is not unanimous. There is disagreement and dissension. Joseph Arimathea, Nicodemus, those two council members, probably others, did not agree that Jesus deserved to be put to death. And so that, that just shows you it's a difficult situation unfolding. Okay, so Dr. Evans, we have the disciples fractured because uh, Judas has betrayed, Peter has denied, Jesus is arrested. Uh, there are these hearings, pre-trials, trials going on, trying to gather evidence and make a case. You have the Jewish leaders then fractured. Then over here you have Pilate uh, in a fascinating study. Let me ask you to delve into Barabbas because there's an interesting thought that you have about followers of Barabbas or he had a corner that was uh, trying to, uh, there, was the, there was the political pitch for him too. What's that all about? Oh yeah, that's, that's related to what's called the Passover pardon. Good politics on Pilate's part. If I'd have been a Roman governor, I'd have done the same thing. 
Passover uh, to the Jewish people would be like oh, Christmas or Easter to Christians. Sure. And so the, the secular governor who doesn't, he's not a Jew, he doesn't believe in their traditions at all, but he wants to do a political thing and that's release a prisoner. The followers of Barabbas know this. So they show up for the annual Passover offer. So he has a lobby. Yes. They're lobbying right. for him. So well, the governor would bring out, uh, you know, maybe a few prisoners and say, who would you like for me to be released? And what he's basically saying is, look, I'm a reasonable man. I'm a lenient man. I'm a good Roman governor. And out of respect for your holiday, I will release one of your people. So you make the call. That's really what it is. You could almost make a game show out of it. <laughs> and so there he is. Well, the followers of Barabbas know this, so they're there. And now here's what's unusual. The followers of Caiaphas, they know this too. Mm -hmm. Normally, the ruling priests and the Barabbas-type crowd, which is cutthroats, calling for revolution, overthrowing the Romans, overthrowing the ruling priests too and replacing them with better guys, they're normally at odds. Lots of agendas here. This time... They have a common goal. Barabbas's crowd wants Barabbas released. They're not impressed with Jesus. I mean, what kind of a Messiah is Jesus? He says, turn the other cheek, pray for your enemies, forget that. And the ruling priests want to get rid of Jesus. So all of a sudden they come together. That's like oil and water mixed together. And what do they do? They call for the release of Barabbas. And when Pilate says, well, then what do I do with Jesus? They all shout out together crucify him. Yeah. And that is a beautiful study of, of, you might say, politics unfolding on the fly so everybody gets what they want. Wow. And yet in the midst of all of that, we go back to the all-important narrative of Jesus Christ making his way to the cross so that we might experience his forgiveness. Well, what Jesus did was he bore for us the unbearable. Spiritually speaking, in reference to the burden of sin, but also physically speaking, with respect to the pain of the crucifixion experience. Jesus had been beaten so severely. Mm. I know a lot of people criticize Mel Gibson's film for overdoing it, but he didn't, he didn't really he didn't. overdo it in that film. The flagellation, would, people would be whipped it right through their skin, it right into the muscle, sometimes right to the bone. The organs. The first century uh, historian Josephus actually described one man being flagellated, whipped to the bone. Yeah. I looked it up in the text, the original language, that's what it says. Jesus is so weak, so badly beaten, he's lost so much blood, he can't carry the cross piece. I know when you see reenactments, it's the entire cross shaped like that. It's actually only the patibulum the cross piece mm -hmm. that the crucifixion victim carries. Jesus can't even carry that. And he had told his disciples, if you're going to follow me, you've got to be able to pick up your cross and come after me. He can't even carry that. That's how injured he is. So when we talk about a burden, it's literal and not just spiritual. There's a number on the screen that you can call. And on the other end of that phone line are friends who would love to take an open Bible and share with you how this one who went to the cross to die for you would love to have eternal relationship with you. You can experience the forgiveness of sins, receive the gift of eternal life. The hymn writer put it well, amazing love, how can it be that thou my God would die for me? Jesus Christ, God in flesh, gave his life for you. Would you call us and allow us the opportunity to pray with you encourage you and help you understand this wonderful love of God as best we can from the scriptures.